सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली National Interest this week celebrates the launch of INS Vikrant Indian Navy's new flagship and before you hear more from me about it particularly about the size of the achievement the meaning the questions it raises and also the debates it launches before we get there my once a month reminder to you to renew your subscription and if you haven't taken one is it take a fresh one it's very simple please look at the screen you just have to go to this link and then follow where the link takes you and choose your plan of course i'll be very happy if you choose the three year plan so go ahead and do it and let me get back to the point again so the commissioning of ins vikrant the new avatar of indian navy's first aircraft carrier a flag carrier by the same name for almost 5 decades that was the flag carrier almost for 5 decades this is a day of celebration for all of india and for good reason at about 3 times the size of the original at about 3 times the original that is 42800 tons versus 16000 tons it isn't just the biggest warship designed and built in india it is also fully a swadeshi design that's a matter of great pride as it places india among an elite list of nations with the ability to build such a warship a list so elite you can mostly count it on the hands of on the fingers of one hand of course we are excluding britain for now you need to be a rare indian indifferent to such national achievement or maybe one from the somewhat less rare community of war hating give peace a chance walas to not join in the celebration we are none of these so congratulations indian navy its brilliant and evolving design bureau engineers marine warfare visionaries and of course india's political leaders spanning 25 years and the tenure of three prime ministers beginning with atal bihari bajpay it was under his leadership that the designing process of this make in india or now atmanirbhar aircraft carrier began in 1999 the cabinet committee of security under him cleared the project for construction in 2002 and 2002 early 2003 we can ask why it took india with its humongous engineering base 23 years to commission the ship especially when the Chi- when the chinese would build a much bigger one along with the aircraft in just 3 to 4 years and in any case for the new vikrant the engines are american they are american ge imports as is a lot else the chinese meanwhile already have two fully operational carriers one of them entirely home made almost twice the size of the new vikrant carrying not only many more aircraft but way more potent ones like the chinese made j15 or other chinese copies of sukhoi 30 variants the third aircraft carrier which the chinese with their speed may operationalize as early as next year is estimated to be in the 1 lakh ton class but these are the perennial issues with india's defense manufacturing we could be asking we could also be asking why after all the orders they've got hal is only delivered only 30 tejas tejas aircraft to indian air force by now or maybe why india's main battle tank program has been languishing for such a long time so those are questions that keep coming up and we keep we been fretting over these and will continue to do so unfortunately although i hope not i hope big things begin to change in any case this is the time now to look at the future with an open and positive mind three immediate questions therefore arise one the most important one is does india need aircraft carriers and if so what kind and how many and third what kind of firepower should and can india feel from these mighty vessels and where will it come from carriers versus submarines has been the most enduring debate in naval warfare for more than 75 years now 
In World War II, carriers, especially the giant American and Japanese ones, brought a new di dimension to marine warfare. The Germans focused on their submarines or U-boats as these were called. This is where <coughs> the larger idea of sea control, that is aircraft carriers versus sea denial, that is submarines, originated. During almost the entire Cold War, the Western world followed the original US doctrine simply because they had the US Navy available at their disposal. So they followed that doctrine while the Soviet Navy and the Soviet bloc, Warsaw Pact, invested heavily in sea denial. They built a large armada of super silent and super lethal submarines. Much of the literature you read on that debate tells us that not only was the belief in submarine warfare almost ideological in the Soviet Navy, here was also a cost argument. The leaders of the Soviet Union knew that they couldn't afford to engage in a race to build large service combatants with expensive air elements with the much richer West. They were going to be pauperized. They were therefore to find deterrence and tactical balance through sea denial, the threat of massive attrition that the loss of even one carrier-sized vessel would entail. What are the Chinese doing right now? China's, Chinese are producing missile after missile, long range, very accurate, cheap, so they can find, they could fire a bunch of them, say at a big giant US aircraft carrier, and they are call, calling them carrier busters, right? So basically saying that one missile worth maybe a few pennies, relatively, could go and sink one of your super carriers worth so many billions of dollars. So that is how attrition is used as an instrument of sea denial. We've read authentic accounts of how when the US 7th Fleet Task Force led by super carrier then USS Enterprise sailed towards India while the 1971 war raged, it was stalked by Soviet submarines. This began to change in the last decades of the Cold War when the Soviets also thought that maybe they also needed some air power on the seas. Not big ones, but some air power. The Soviets then went ahead and built a small carrier, relatively small, ironically named after Admiral Gorshkov, the founder of its mostly submarine and missile oriented navy and the author of that sea denial doctrine. That by the way is the ship the Soviets sold to India. We bought it, India bought it and renamed it Vikramaditya after retrofitting it. It is currently India's flag carrier. It moved up in the size to 44,500 tons. That's almost twice as much as the one that we got in the middle, which is INS Virat, which in the interim Indian Navy had acquired uh, as another junked British vessel like the first one. This was also a junk British vessel, HMS Hermes which served as INS Virat at 23,700 tons. This was one and a half times bigger than the first Vikrant. The new Vikrant is about as much weight as the Vikramaditya. While much of India's military might was built around Soviet Russian equipment and training, say 1964 onwards, the Navy caught the carrier bug early. In 1942, the Royal Navy had commissioned a bunch of new carriers in what was called the Majestic class. Some were still semi-built when the war ended. One of these, HMS Hercules, was bought by India, completed at Belfast in Ireland, and it became INS Vikrant. In fact, it was received on behalf of Indian Navy by Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, Jawaharlal Nehru's sister. That won the surface combatant versus submarine debate in the Indian Navy for more than a decade. Starting 1957, say, going until 1967 when change came. It had troublesome results. 1965 war is not something the Indian Navy would like very much to talk about. And for good reason. A seven-ship task force of Pakistan Navy led by cruiser PNS Babur got close enough to Temple Town of Dwarka on Gujarat coast with obvious religious messaging. And plaster it, plaster Dwarka with their 5.25 inch guns unopposed. It's a very big artillery gun that, that ships employ. This is really going back to Second World War. It's a 16 centimeter gun. So these ships fired these guns unopposed for quite some time, gave the town a real plastering and went back. Indian Navy did not join the fight. 
not only because INS Vikrant, the flagship then, was in dry dock, as it often was in its service decades, but also because there was a wariness about PNS Ghazi, the only submarine in the subcontinent then. So there was a fear about submarines. Why take Panga with submarines? Because it was a new element, it was a new dimension in warfare. And there, your air aircraft carrier, unfortunately, was more a liability than a strength. It was only after this that India acquired its first submarines, the Soviet Foxtrots. But in 1971 again, Vikrant had to be taken far away, as far away from Arabian Sea as possible because nobody wanted to risk it in the Arabian Sea where Pakistan Navy and Pakistan Air Force was also present. It was taken very far away, it operated in the east, it was first taken to the Andaman Nicobar Islands and then taken to the Bangladesh sector, East Pakistan sector and it carried out operations over Chittagong and Cox's Bazar very effectively made a big difference but once again there was no opposition for the Pakistani Air Force and Pakistan Navy. The concern was still the same, PNS Ghazi. By the way, we all know that it was lowered and sunk off Vishakhapatnam in a storied operation. Films have been made about it, Ghazi Attack and also Razi, which is my favourite film in the genre made by Meghna Gulzar, starring Alia Bhatt and Vicky Kaushal. The Pakistanis also then had French Daphnes, again silent, smaller submarines. One of those, PNS Hangor, sank the frigate INS Kukri not far from Diu along the western seaboard. Military doctrines tend to be much too durable. I wish they were more flexible and more mobile, but they are much too durable. Naval ones, most of all. Indian Navy has accordingly kept the idea of multiple carrier-based task forces close to its heart. It is the capital cost, inability to build at home in the past, and shifting political emphasis that has rarely given it the luxury of even being able to field two carriers at any point of time. By the time the second one comes, the first one is struggling. The new Vikrant can change all of this. Which brings us back to the three questions we had raised earlier on. I raised this question with Carnegie Endowment's Ashley Tellis, who is a globally acknowledged strategic affairs expert of Indian origin. His name is quite familiar in the Indian strategic community and also among Indian readers and viewers, particularly readers and viewers of the print, which even if I may say so, just because I have a great team and great colleagues, gives you the best coverage, analysis and insights on strategic and global affairs, strategic, military and global affairs. So, Ashley Tellis, who just came out with a new book and we talked about his book on a recent episode of off the cuff, which you might have seen, and, and if you haven't, I am giving you a link. I asked him the same question, does India need aircraft carriers? And he said, before asking that question, you have to first decide what are India's geopolitical objectives, then define these geographically. And once you define those, we can then debate the question of whether India needs aircraft carriers or not. He said, if your objectives are limited to say a thousand kilometer rad radius from your peninsula, that by the way takes Karachi, Gwadar, uh, Djibouti, a lot of that into its sweep and also a lot on the other side. So he said, if, you're, if, you're, if your vision is limited to thousand kilometers from your peninsular coast, India does not need any carriers because all this can be done easily and much more effectively by shore-based aircraft, especially with mid-air refueling. Look at Sukhoi 30s, for example, a range of radius of operating radius of nearly a thousand kilometers can become even longer with refueling, one and a half times larger. So all, the, all of this can be done with shore-based aircraft at much lesser expense and you can then field a lot more air power in the same theatre. If your vision is to be a player in more distant zones, he argued, say to East Africa, and southeastern Asia, then you need carriers. But then what kind of carriers? To which he argues, and you can watch this part of, part of the conversation in a separate clip that I have taken out from the full interview, of which also I will share a link with you. He says Indian Navy has made the worst possible choices. His line, not mine. He says Indian Navy has made the worst possible choices when it comes to aircraft carriers. Indian Navy has bought, he says, or built expensive small carriers which are hugely manpower intensive and pack too little firepower. I mean, it's a, 
see, it's still a sizable ship with maybe 1,500 people, a lot of expense, but it goes, t takes you far away from your coast. It only feels just about a squadron of fighter planes of limited potency. And that is the problem. So he says the current complement of a maximum of 20 or so MiG-29 Ks from these ships will give you too little range, too little weapon load and too little time on station. Time on station is how much time can you spend in a battle zone. We know that the Navy just held trials for the next generation fighters. That is Rafale, the Marine version, the Naval version and F-A 18s, uh, F-A 18 Super Hornets, these are American made. These give at least twice the fighting radius of a MiG-29 and much more war load. What's in, even more interesting, these will give you much greater serviceability. For example, today at any given point of time, Indian Navy is not able to field more than 40%, just over one third of its entire MiG-29 uh, force because it is it is so maintenance heavy, so maintenance intensive. Right now, Indian Navy has 42 MiG-29s. It's not buying any more just now. So at least until a decision is made on the new aircraft, the new aircraft carrier also will be fielding maybe about a dozen out of these aircraft. A dozen odd would operate from Vikramaditya. Rest will be constantly in maintenance. So this will be too little bang for too much buck. That's why TELUS argues these carriers are too small to pack a real punch. Not cost effective, not value for money. 40 years of research and experience at US Navy, he says, shows that to be a potent force, a carrier needs to be in the 65,000 tons plus range, which is Indian Navy's vision for its IAC-3 project, which it wants government's clearance on. But again, the question of numbers, costs, aircraft and so on will arise. In any case, money will have to be diverted for these platforms, very expensive platforms, from somewhere else. Will it be at the cost of the submarines or more deadly missiles or other vessels or the IAF or the army? They will always be competing demands and they will be limited budgets. That's why doctrinal clarity is so crucial. These are tough questions. India's military and political leaderships need to debate and decide on. Right now though, let's celebrate the arrival of this beautiful baby, the new INS Vikrant. Months before the first aircraft takes off from it, even for trials, it has already contributed by re-sparking this eternal doctrinal debate.